the masterpieces. Those of you who've been in the class before know that it's not a conventional art history class. I'm not an art history expert. I'm just an art lover. And what I wanna do is just to share that love, that passion with you. And the whole purpose of it is to just enjoy looking at art and making some connections with it. For example, in this picture here, uh, first of all, you see that it's not really a very serious art history class. Secondly, the connections that you would make with it if you didn't know anything about art history is that it's kind of an enigmatic picture. I mean, who are these people standing on that bridge in front of that fantastic sky? So the artist has kind of intrigued you. What is, what is selfie worthy about this? Uh, what about that guy in the back? I mean, come on, look pretty scary. But if you have had a little bit of our history, and most of us have, even by osmosis, um, we'd be able to identify not only the characters in the selfie, but perhaps who the artist did them. So asking yourself for two seconds, if you can, I'll now point out that we have Mona Lisa doing the hard work of the selfie. And behind her is the girl with the pearl earring. Behind her is the screamer. We don't know the gender of the screamer. And the artists here in the forefront are Da Vinci, Vermeer, and Munk people whose masterpieces are so well known that they don't even need to use their first names. And then behind it, we have that incredible sky that many of you will recognize as the Starry Night by Van Gogh. And perhaps your connection with that might be what an incredible way it is to think about the stars in motion. So there might be a little bit of emotion as a connection. And then down below, I talked about another connection. I got to see the Van Gogh immersion in San Francisco. And I had talked about it before in class and sort of wasn't really that fond. It, it looked kind of corny to me. I thought it was fantastic. It animates Van Gogh's work from the very beginning to the very end of his life, which was a short life, unfortunately, beautifully done. It's now also in San Jose, but it's a different show. So I don't know if I recommend it. Okay, let's get started on today's class. So today we're looking at how artists look at life. Of course, there's gonna be, there are many artists who look at life that, that aren't in today's lesson, but we're concentrating on looking through the eye of the artist, to the eye of the beholder. I'm showing this Magritte. We're not concentrating on Magritte, but this, this eye is so perfect because what we see through our eye changes every minute so that art can't capture everything about it. The other connection I make is, this is the eye on which the CBS eye is, is fashioned. So let's go on. And we're gonna be talking about the artist's point of view. Now here we have a very tall artist whose point of view has influenced the art that we see up on the wall. For example, we see the turtle and the dog from high above, and we see the bird flying right at the, the artist's face, as is the pig, as in pigs don't fly. And the artist is working on a genre of painting from above. You'll see the work that he's uh, modeling down below, and then up above what he's seen. And I think you all know what that style of work, that genre is. So the first way that we're looking at what artists see is through still life. An artist, or we might just look at a rock, but an artist, or we can have all sorts of imaginative ideas about that rock. So, the picture that comes over to us doesn't necessarily have to be an exact replica. And it's nothing new. There were still lifes on the tombs in Egypt. Here we have one that features food, which is often a subject of, of still life. Here's some from 
Rome that were found buried in the ashes of the uh, Vesuvius. I really love this one on the left. Those peaches are so juicy. The artist has used shading, has used the ref to make ref the uh, peaches look rounder, and also the reflections on the uh, glass. I think that's that's good stuff. I'll compare it to a another artist later on. The one that we're going to start with is probably the most famous, and I I have to credit Maria who is in this class. One of my very first classes, I had planned to talk about Dutch still life, but I ran out of time. I talked too much as I am wont to do. And so at the end during discussion, she said, she raised her hand, she said, hey, what about still life? So seven classes later, dear Maria, we are gonna be talking about still life. And let's look at this one. This is classic. This is a Dutch still life on which so many still lives are based. There's much more to it than meets the eye. And to tell you the truth, I often would pass these up because they all kind of look the same to me and kind of boring, but not anymore. I'm giving you a couple of seconds to just look and see what you see. Name it in your head, like bubble, skull, crown, and what else you see. Okay. Now let's look at a video about how you read these. You read them the same way we do when we like tackle the tough ones in, in an Ollie class or reading literature. Traditional ways of reading Dutch still life paintings. So in order to say something about what you think is going on in these paintings. It's important, I think, to know traditionally how they were looked at by art historians and art critics. So in order to do that, let's start with this 1668 Dutch painting by Maria van Osterwijk, where we see a rather standard symbol of vanitas, which is the first way that paintings were looked at historically. The skull represents sort of a moral lesson of life's briefness or the passing of everything that's material about this world and how sort of unimportant it is. In this particular painting, the skull is partially obscured by other items, and that's a bit unusual if you compare it with a lot of the other paintings. In the second Dutch painting by William Claus Hedda, we can see that the idea of vanitas is conveyed in a much more subtle way, such as, you see that peeled lemon? It could represent the quick unraveling of a short life. Or, you see that goblet that's overturned? That could signify that a person was just there in the painting, but is now absent, which could be read as a type of dying. Now, this Vanitas theme is closely linked with a second concept, and that is of other kinds of moral lessons, such as the sin of gluttony, found here in the gorged mincemeat pie. Or if we look at that goblet, that overturned goblet again, in the opulence and wealth, there might be a commentary on the sin of greed. So there's one more, the third way that these paintings are talked about historically. And we see this in the 1658 painting by van der Spelt. And in this painting, the artist creates a rather dramatic, it's my favorite, dramatic sense of depth by including the blue silk curtain which looks like it's ready to be pulled back. Now, of course, there is no depth. And that ability to sort of trick the eye into believing that there is, is called trick of the eye or trompe l'air. By the way, since we're looking at this painting, can you find an example of vanitas in this depiction? Did you notice there over on the left how Vanderspelt includes a wilted flower? 
I think this wilted flower is a sort of more subtle version of the human skull. Now you might be thinking. So we're, uh, we, we cut it off because he's going into another subject. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about vanity. So the, it's the vanity of thinking that we sort of can control our lives and the vanity of gluttony and greed and some of the others that he did. Here we have a cartoon in, uh, that was in the, my New Yorker calendar, you know, a daily New Yorker cartoon. And here we have a man who is showing his vanity, probably a monarch of some sort, probably in his, his velvet and his ermine in front of a sort of a still life, uh, showing all of this opulence that he's able to control and to eat any minute. Then we have the art aficionados there in front of the rope who are looking at the selfie taker. And they say, when did people come, become so vain and self-obsessed? Okay, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Here's Georges Latour, also in the 17th century, but French. Often, if you see a candle you, like this, you, you're, you're pretty sure it's George Latour. He's really big on candles. But what we have here is the penitent Magdalene, and she's sitting at a table. I wonder how many of you know what the, that kind of a table is named. Yeah, it's a vanity table. It's a dressing table. And she's looking into the mirror. But look closely. There's a still life. There's our skull talking about the passing of life. There's our candle that will burn down to the end of life. And there's our sign of, of uh, greed with the jewelry. So what thoughts are going through her mind, we don't know, or even if she's looking at herself. But George Latour combined the Vanitas still life in this picture of Magdalene. This one is fun. Give you a second to look at the whole thing. Look at the tipped over glass. That was talked about with the goblet. Music also talks about how we spend our time frivolously. Another somewhat sinful thing. Look at the escaping smoke, the vanishing smoke, the things that are ephemeral that will pass away. And look at the crystal ball. And then over on the right, you see the crystal ball close up and it is more vanity because the artist is reflecting himself in it. Here's Clara Peters. She did a self portrait, showing herself up front with her still life. Once again, look for the signs of vanity. Here we see money in the lower right hand corner what do you see and what do you think that is? I think the modern interpretation would be that life is a crapshoot, you know, or the luck of life. Here's the bubble again, the bubble that'll, that'll go away in an instant, like life. And here is a still life by Clara Peters. Very photographically realistic incredible, incredible work. And she wants to make sure that she, you know who did it. So you can see on the side of the, the knife in the front, her name, and on the lid of that jug, her reflection. A little vanity there. So a little diversion. We're now looking at an artist that some of you even may know because she's a Monterey artist. Not all of our masterpieces are giant masterpieces that are in museums. Sometimes it's fun to compare them with artists that are local, which we'll do a few times today. Look at her still life with lemons on the left. That dessert in the middle is so deliciously painted that I, I really would like a piece of it right now. And she also does a lot with toys. And here's sort of an homage to Castroville. On top, remember this is all a painting. It's photorealistic, but the, like that carton looks so real. But the guy on the scooter 
is delivering an artichoke. And I put down here that her work is in many galleries, but here in the Winfield Gallery, which is one of my favorites in Carmel. Here's Rachel Reich, specialized in flowers, very successful. Her portrait is up at the top and next to it, a, an engraving that was done in her elderly years, showing elements of still life and her palette and brushes. Many books you can see, especially if you want some inspiration, if you like to do flower arranging, but look at the artistry in these flowers. That softness, it's like silk. They're just beautifully, beautifully done. Now, I'm showing you at the top a book that, that I enjoyed. I got it the last time I was at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. It's called How to Be an Art Rebel, and it's a kid's art book. And this is the from the section on still life. You'll see that there the cheese is falling off the table in sort of a trompe l'oeil kind of a way, and uh, flies are attacking it. But here's where I learned about these still life. On the left, you have a flower still life by Fontaine Latour, a bouquet of diverse flowers done at the end of the 19th century. This is a belle époque. This is when the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists were, were painting. And they were not being that successful. They weren't really doing that many sales. But Fontaine Latour was more successful because this is a traditional painting. Well, the one on the right, is a photograph by Ori Gerst, an Israeli photographer. And this piece of art is one that he had an, a flower arranger simulate a Fontaine Latour bouquet. Then he freeze dried it and blew it up and freeze framed it. So this still life is of still life. This is a topic that some of these still life painters did. This is in the 18th century. It's Chardin, French, traditionally painted, where we have the different attributes. You can see the palette and the brushes. You see the red book that would be a book of drawings. You see the tinsmith's art. You see the rolled up architectures art. And then the rewards which are according them is this reward that is coming off the top of the table there. So here are some more still life paintings of paintings. Antonio Bueno, Italian on the left, shows a, what we call a stretcher or the easel that the artist paints on the canvas that is stretched over it, turned to the, toward the wall, the palette, the brushes, some of the artist's tools. In the middle, we have the same subject done in the 70s by the pop artist Roy Lichtenstein, where he makes it look like a comic book so that we popularize life around us. And then here's Cam Pam Carroll again on the right. This is extraordinary because the effect of watercolor is so very different from the effect of oil or acrylic for her to reproduce a, a watercolor palette this way is, is really quite fantastic. So artists skullduggery through the, the centuries. As you look at these, you will see the topics of, of uh, still life that we've talked about. Peter Kleiss on the left. Then I stuck Van Gogh in. Now that's not really a still life. This is kind of a fun one he did when he had a brief, uh, time in art school. Those of you who, who have said on the chat that you saw Van Gogh emerge and you'll know that they, they animated the smoke coming out of that cigarette. Then we have Picasso. This is the same subject exactly as the first picture. The skull, the candle, and the fruits in the bowl. In, well, it's not exactly the same because they, the first one didn't have fruit. But he's deconstructing it and showing it to you in planes of shapes 
so that you feel as if it's a three-dimensional picture. The one on the right is our next artist. I wonder, those of you who are art aficionados, if you can recognize the style and can guess our next artist. I do this throughout the class because sometimes it's fun to do artist guessing. And when you get the PowerPoint on my website, you will be able to um, see the, the name of the artist filled in. And that artist is Paul Cezanne. We're gonna be looking at Paul Cezanne in different ways in different classes. If Michelle has, has room for this class uh, next fall, I would do Cezanne again because he has so many different styles. But let's look at a video now telling us a little bit about Paul Cezanne and still life. The still life is a persistent subject throughout art history, but for many it's seen as academic, principally a zone of exercise or training. Cezanne is one of few artists who elevated this subject to a principal subject that is exciting and beautiful to look at. He celebrated the quotidian and he reinvented our way of engaging or seeing the natural world through these objects. Of course, there are other artists who've painted great still lifes, among them Rembrandt, Monet, a great range, but none for whom the still life is the most exalted subject matter in their entire career. This is on behind me, a still life with apples and pears from 1888 to 1890 comes from the peak period of Cezanne's work when he was in Provence, shortly following his marriage to his longtime love and a time when he was painting many of his most famous canvases, whether the Mont Saint-Victoire series or the Harlequin. This is a masterful example of the best of his still life work. Cezanne was devoted to the still life genre throughout his career. He painted them from the 1860s and 1870s onwards and until the very end of his life. The early works are characterized by more severe contrast, often dark backgrounds, wider whites in the ceramics, and less modulated color, far less of the hatching stroke that he would introduce later in his career. This period is distinguished by a focused attention on smaller setting of objects on the table usually, an absence of more decorative, elaborate component objects such as tablecloths or ornamental objects that would often feature in both the early works and the later works. What I love about this work is that you can see so much of what's so important and radical about Cezanne's art conveyed through this incredibly humble and simple image. I'm really attracted to the incredible economy here and the beauty, but also the shocking modernity of just focusing on such a simple subject and making it look so fresh. And even today, in the context of contemporary art, this looks so incredibly direct and forthright and yet so intelligently painted. I think what comes across in all of the histories of Cezanne and the homage paid to him by other artists is that he was such a smart painter. And that really comes across even more clearly in such a simple image. Cezanne was really a maverick of the period. He did something quite different from anybody that would become a precursor to so many artists who followed him. You can see the influence of Cezanne's use of the palette knife very clearly and directly in Van Gogh's work. You can see the influence of his palette and his approach to large, flat planes of color in Gauguin's work. He is very explicitly cited by Picasso and Brock as the origin or inspiration of Cubism in his conception of space. 
he was equally an influence on Matisse, and there are examples of early Matisse's that are quite clearly directly modeled on Cezanne's still lifes. He is quite clearly the father of modernism as we know it. Thank you, Leslie. Somebody um, was, was nice enough on the chat when I when I asked, do you want to guess the artist? They guessed Gauguin. And I think it's interesting that she pointed out that uh, Gauguin and um, Cezanne have something in common. The video also mentioned a couple of times the intellectual, the smart side of Cezanne. I think that's so important. And this is a quote from him. There are two things in the painter the eye and the mind, each of them should aid the other. That kind of leaves out emotion. It leaves out a couple of things. And, and Cezanne is noted as an intellectual painter. At, currently at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they're having a show of Cezanne's drawings. And some of the writing that I've read about them, they do bring up that intellectual side of Cezanne. He said, with an apple, I will astonish Paris. Well, not so much. He did work in Paris. He worked with the other impressionists that we're familiar with. They didn't get along that well. And um, Cezanne returned to Aix-en-Provence. You can visit his studio. We saw a little bit of that, this picture on the left, the still life with plaster Cupid. This is right outside Aix in, in the south of France. And you see that same Cupid on the um, little commode back there and some of the fruits and then people are looking at the tools in his studio. So I checked and it's still open. Cezanne is the father of us all, Picasso is said to have said. So we see on the left, the Cezanne. We see how he's molded the fruit. Remember I mentioned about the Roman fruit early on, how beautifully molded it was using just color and shadow. This is also very typically Cezanne, the napkin, the tablecloth thing that's on there, the fruit in the white bowl. Picasso, who experimented all of his long life with so many different styles and we'll be looking at and next week more closely, tried also to show the space, the three-dimensional, taking the same subject, the white bowl and the fruit and the cloth, breaking it up into shapes. It's hard to look at sometimes cubism, but once again, it's an intellectual activity. Here the artist is communicating with you, look here, here's still another way we can see life. Now here is fruit from Monterey and from France. On the left, you see a artist studio where the painting up above is a still life featuring the statue down below. It's not a Cupid, it looks like a Maasai warrior. And in the back, we and in, in the uh, picture we see the ceramics, we see the flowers, which are in person down below on top of that lovely table. To the right, this artist has painted an homage to Cezanne. The homages were talked about and it's just showing, I recognize Cezanne. It's just like in literature where writers give an homage to a writer that's done before with little hints to them. Here she has shown, look at the, the outlines around the fruit and around the bowl there. On the right, we have two Cezannes to compare it. I wonder if any of you can guess the artist um, and let's, uh, let's see who it is. It's Erin Lee Gaffill. Once again, I bet there are people in, in this class who, who might know her. Here she is posing in one of the fabulous sweaters that her 
her uncle made. Her uncle and she are part of the family that has Nepenthe. Her brother her, works there now, manages Nepenthe. You see her painting in a landscape at the top and Big Sur down at the bottom where she was born. You can see her work at Nepenthe. Also, I ran into it the other day, I was at the Dowd um, Arcade in Carmel and it's, they have a lot of wonderful little works by her at the Blackbird shop in the Dowd Arcade. But where I saw this studio was at the Monterey Museum of Art at one of the best shows I've ever seen at the museum. She and her uncle, Cafe Facet, did a joint show. I'm showing you the book that is done for the show called Color Duets. Once a year, her uncle comes in from England where he now lives, at least the UK, maybe it's Scotland, and uh, they work together. So this show, she has reproduced her studio as I show you before. You can see some of his knitting in the back. She's wearing one of his sweaters again in that, in that picture. Some of their family pictures over on the side. And in the next room, I thought I died and got into heaven because I knew I was going to be talking about still life. They show a, they reproduced what Kaffee Fawcett and Aaron Lee Capital do together that once a year, they paint together. They do color duets. So you see in the background a still life. And in the foreground or the middle ground, you see a work that Aaron Lee Gaffel was working on and one that I guess Kaffee Fawcett has finished because he signed it. That's how I figured out who did which one. And if you look at them very closely, though they're both looking at the same life, there's lots of differences. Look at the shading in the background at Baron Lee Gaffel's. Look at the elongation of the, the, um, the bowl and the different design that Kaffee Fawcett has painted. So I just, I just love this as an example. Andy Warhol popped out still life paintings too, kind of the, the grand master of the pop movement. Most of us are familiar with the tomato soup can and with the Brillo soap pads. And he often would still screen them, do them in multiples. I can't help wondering if there also might be some messages of a sort of vanitas in these, because Andy Warhol comes from the world of advertising and is he making a statement about the barrage of images that are coming down on us all the time, about the multiples, but a little bit about money making and greed? That's, I, I haven't heard him say, but it's a possibility. The next artist looks a lot like Andy Warhol as a youngster, but it's not. Andy Warhol always wore that white wig, but this artist is, uh, showing his own hair. This is this artist when he was, was young. Let you guess and now we'll reveal that that's David Hockney. He's still working, born in 1937. So he's 84 and he's worked through as many artists we're gonna be talking about and have talked about many, many, many different styles. Here he is in doing two still uh, to sell portraits in watercolor. I read into these books by David Hockney at the uh, bookstore in the Carmel Village bookstore called, I think it's Olivia and, and Daisy. And they're both by David Hockney and Martin Gayford, who is an art critic. The one above is for adults and the one below is for children, but they're both delightful. This is a spread of pages from the children's book. I often will bring up children's book because both for kids and for adults, I think they're a wonderful way of looking at art with a clear mind, not muddled by all of the theories and movements and in all in art history. I love this one on the left. I love, I love David uh, 
Hogney's whimsy. Here we have him pulling aside that curtain. Remember in, in the video, it showed the curtain sort of like revealing the picture and also giving depth. But what we reveal is a man that's made out of different shapes, kind of a, a sort of a cubist thing and his still life. And on the right, I'm comparing that to another artist who is showing off his mastery, not only of still life, but of landscape and pulling aside that curtain saying, look what I did, which is often perhaps the attention of many artists. Why not? They're geniuses. They are showing off their talent. Here's Hockney on the left with his 30 sunflowers. I'm pretty sure you'll know who the artist is on the right. And I think that Hockney on, on, in his picture is paying homage to Van Gogh with the sunflowers for a couple of reasons. One of them is those canvases, stretchers turned away from us so we don't see the image. Sort of a comment on the end of Van Gogh's career. Also the wilting sunflower on the table. Van Gogh often showed at least one wilted flower, which is also a subject of vanitas, where the artist might show that as a sign of the end of life. You can see in Van Gogh's picture in the upper right-hand quadrant, that one wilted flower. International fruit. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the Spanish art Francisco de Zerberan. It's done in high chiaroscuro, which is the contrast of light and dark, which really makes the images pop. Below, we have Vincent van Gogh, who makes his images pop by the contrast of colors, the oranges and the yellows against the teal and the green and those fabulous blue gloves. And then the two on the right are by David Hockney, and he did them on his iPad. And they are really <laughs> marvelous. We have these, this, this photo effect of the glass reflected below and that gilt around the, the, uh, the plate. Now, this is an artist who does, does still life but he also did this still larger than life in trompe l'oeil. And look at it carefully by trompe l'oeil. I'm looking about, the, talking about, look at that apple exploding out of the picture on the right, exploding out of the frame. And then of course there's others, carrots and corn and bell pepper and oranges and the artichoke popping out. But if you look down below, at street level, you'll see some little traffic cones and you'll see the lights and you'll realize he has done this as a mural on the side of a building. Let's find out more about this artist. I discovered him while doing this class and I'm in love with him. Jonathan Queen, probably the youngest artist that we're going to look at today. He, like me, has a toy collection. Mine's not as great as his, although we do have some in common. You see Betty Boop over on the left and um, you see uh, Pinocchio. There's Bob's big boy from the restaurant that I grew up near, the Tin Man in the back. The middle picture up on the top is another one of his murals. This is a rendering of a mural that he did perfect. And then you see him up at the right with a few more of his toys. And what he did is do still lives, paintings. These are all three paintings of his toys put into interesting situations like Pinocchio and the, the uh, toy bird. There's a tin man trying but not succeeding to get his heart hanging up there with a monkey on his back. The passage of time from Vanitas. And what looks like a spilled goblet from the Dutch days is not. That's the, the oil can that the tin man needs to get his rust out. And then the right one, it's kind of surrealistic. It's kind of magical, more like a fantasy. 
a little girl doll who looks at life through a camera, which in sort of a selfie age is kind of like what happens. These are incredible. They all pay homage to the Dutch Vanitas still life. Second sight, the, the skull is on top of a book called Diseases of the Eye. And the disease here is that his eye is covered by a peacock feather, which we know is a, well, we don't know, but I looked it up, is, is a sign of uh, vanity. And death, staring death in the face with, there's that oil can again, and the clock. Explanation, I don't know. I haven't seen any explanations of these works. But there's a baby doll playing with some intestines and some pictures in the back of anatomy. There's our skull. But the thing on the head is like a reel that's used for the old film. Most of us remember film, I believe. Uh, like my father used to shoot. And it gives the baby doll the look a little baby Jesus. Down the bottom, this is, this is great for, for those of us who are writers and work on projects and artists, waiting for inspiration to come out of that light bulb, revealing the brain, just trying to get that idea come in, the slowness of it coming with the turtle shell, and then the slow truck that's taking the, uh, the skeleton toward. In the back, we have a painter by Peter Bruegel, one of my favorites that you will see a couple of times today. And it is the Tower of Babel. That is a, his painting of the Bible story where they're trying to build this tower and they can't communicate because they don't have a common language. And I think we just got a chat. Maybe that, maybe that um, piece up there is a heart. I think that's what it says. I can just see the top of that, that chat. Yeah, I was wondering if it might be a heart. Um, my anatomy is not that good. So in the, in the Tower of Babel, they can't communicate because they don't have a common language. Isn't that one of the things that art and music are really great for? Because we don't have to use words to understand them. I know I use a lot of them, but I think it's fun to read between the words, read between the lines. I know some of you chatted more about that picture. We'll get to your chats later at the end. We're now gonna look at a new artist. These are very typical of his work. He also plays around with toys. He also has a lot of whimsy in his work. These are very typical of his style. The pastel colors, the colored shadow. It, we, he shows Mickey Mouse. He actually worked for the Walt Disney Company at the exact same time my father started, which was 1937. This artist worked as an apprentice animator. He went on to do fine art and teach fine art later. Let's see who it is. The painter is Wayne Thiebaud. And you notice that he was born in 1920, which makes him 100. Each time I show this, I. I, I want to check, but his birthday is in November, so he will be 101 in November. So throughout his long career, he's worked with many different styles. And we are fortunate enough to have in this class somebody who was his friend and neighbor and collected Wayne Tebow. So we'll be drawing on that person's knowledge. This is the most typical work by Wayne Thiebaud, and that's his desserts, often in multiples, like with Wendy Warhol. There's some that call Wayne Thiebaud a pop artist. I definitely would say he's not a pop artist, but as I said, I don't like placing people in artists in particular periods because they express themselves differently. One of the things that's very typical of Wayne Thiebaud is in the lower left-hand corner with these pieces of cake. He loves to smear on like cake icing, his paint. He he's in love with paint. Van Gogh does the same thing and Rembrandt does it every once in a while. So I really enjoy Wayne Thiebaud's joy of painting. These are called delights. And according to our friend who knows a lot more about Wayne Thiebaud, 
It was actually a book of Wayne Thiebaud's work called Delights, not only because of some of these works, but because he himself is a delight. He's also in love with color, and there are many different versions of lipsticks, lipsticks in, in the counters, many, many works by Thiebaud. You can see them at the San Francisco Museum of Art, but in so many of modern art, so many places. Like with Pam Carroll's work, I think this is incredible, showing the paint running down the can, the reflections at the same time, an incredible work, an incredible way of expressing what Wayne Chibo saw in still life. And what fun is this? Gumball machines, they just say fun. They say fun with their color. They say color fun with them all being lined up together. Each one is different. And this gumball machine is a gift to that member of our class. It was given to this member because he posed for Wayne Thiebaud for a portrait. And when Wayne Thiebaud gave him this gumball machine, he actually drew on the, painted on the top, that kind of carnival look. New, new artist. Now, I'm not saying whether this artist is a photographer or a painter. I'll let you think about that for a minute. He is Dutch. He's working today. He was born in 1954. Look at that work. Look at the, the ketchup bottle, the mustard. He's holding some of those condiments there in the picture. Let's look and see more. Well, those are not foodie photos. Those are paintings. High realism, photo realism, still life done today. Now this, paint, this artist is an American still life artist of another ilk. Noel Bernhurst, Barnhurst is a, he has a studio where he, produces photography that is used in magazines, magazine covers, packaging of food. Very successful. He also is the husband of another member of our class who is my friend. And here we see this ice cream cone. Hours would have gone into making the ice cream cone look that delicious that you wanna just lick it to pieces. And then those French fries, you just want to grab one out of the picture. And here's the reason I'm showing Noel Barnhurst. Because the first time I went to visit my friend, I saw this giant picture on the left on the wall. It is 30 inches by 40 inches. So it is used and it's a color photograph printed on steel to make the contrast even greater and the feeling. It is such the opposite of the way silver images were shown in the 17th century that I'm contrasting it with the, the follower of Wilhelm Hedda here showing the silver. But like the pictures that we saw from the Vanitas, there was a message in this, in this work. It was from Noel Barner's series called Inseparable, and he gave it to his wife as a valentine. Now we're gonna leave still life and look at stories from not so still life. You know, this would be a good time to stop, Leslie. And uh, it's 10.54, maybe we can come back at 11. Okay, we've been looking at things close, and now we're going to look at things from farther away and talk about how artists reflect their time and place in ways that they want their viewer to look at it. Now, uh, these two pictures are kind of funny because a lot of people think that the purpose of art is to reflect exactly what life is like, 
which of course is impossible because life is changing every millisecond. So here we should see two, two canvases that are, are the background. Well, this is one of my shameless personal digression of lyrics. And that is that I'm talking more about myself here, but I am gonna be making a point. I wanted to tell you about going to Catalina last month. And if I were to show you these two pictures, you'd have absolutely no idea of what my vacation was like. So let's look at the next two. On the left, you see a bison that I saw from the herd that you saw right before this, up close to the strength of it. The, it was very calm, it was used to people, and it was an extraordinary experience. On the right is this beautiful buck that was coming down a very steep incline, beautifully and gracefully. And one of the things that struck me about the picture was how his antlers are reflected in the bushes around it. So those two moments, this moment would be kinds of things that you might want to express in art. And the reason I chose the bison was because there were storytellers in the caves over 20,000 years ago. And you can see the bison and the horse reflected here on the left one, in the left picture. And then down below, you can see the magnificent bushy kinds of antlers on the deer. On the right is another picture of a bison. And he, the, the artist, don't know if it's a man or a woman, probably a man, is telling a story. Sometimes it's called erect man, bird and bison, but that's up for your interpretation. But there is a story going on here. It was something maybe for religious purposes, hoping for a better hunt, or it might be communicating about a hunt that went on. But the storyteller is using art. The Egyptians did it in their very defined style of the profiles, whether for religion or entertainment. The pictures down below are showing all sorts of different arts and crafts that the artist is showing you that people were indulging in. And here's Peter Broyle back again. And this is called the Village Festival or Kermes. And we know that it's a religious festival by that red triangular flag back there. It's a festival that is celebrating St. George. In this painting, as in many of the, um, the 15th century, 15th century, 16th century, 17th century paintings, there are messages to the viewer and often they're morals. Bruegel often showed like a hundred different proverbs in a painting or a hundred different ways that people can do sins. And in this one, if you look carefully, you'll see some of those. Let's look at the next, next picture. Looking at it close up, there's that flag that says it's a religious ceremony. Down below, we see, it's hard to read, but on the tree there, that's a picture of the Virgin Mary. And there's the church beyond. But Bruegel is showing us the dancers, the, the merrymakers are completely ignoring the religious aspect of the day. Up at the top, in the middle, we have people kissing, we have people getting drunk. Down below, there's a sign of greed, gluttony. We have the spoon in the hat of the man, it looks like a pot on the head of the woman. And on the right, there's the vanity shown in the man who is wearing the peacock feather in his hat. And the musician, who as I said, often shows frivolous activity. So Bruegel, just a master in many, many, many different paintings of showing us what life was like. It all looks very old fashioned and quaint, but remember these are modern people to him 
These are people dressed the way he knew them. Now, I had planned to show a Dutch genre scene at this point, but then I found something in the news and it changed the, the Dutch scene that I was gonna show you. I'm going to show you that on the left, Vermeer's girl reading a letter that I would have shown you. For many years, it wasn't known what the letter was about, what the story really was. There are no real hints to it. Well, recently for a exposition at a museum in Dresden, they have found that on the wall behind her, there is a Cupid. They, they did this by carefully for two and a half years, restoring the picture to its original by taking away the paint with a scalpel, see up at the top next to that thumb, taking away the paint and revealing that Cupid. And we know that it's a Vermeer Cupid because you see the same painting in others of his. Gérardis Renoir was one of the many Impressionists who chronicled the 19th century, the Belle Epoque, the last years of the 19th century, the way they knew it. Once again, think of this as just modern. I mean, look at the, the dance on the left. It could be at a, a, a dance hall now with all the people in dressed with in cargo pants and cute little sundresses, but this is showing life as Renoir knew it. And then his famous voting party on the right, showing his friends all around the table who are communicating. I'm not sure you all have heard of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. It's now under construction in Exposition Park in Los Angeles. You can see it's a rendering there near the Coliseum in Exposition Park. When I was growing up down south in, in Southern California, Exposition Park was where the Los Angeles County Museum of Art was before it moved to Wilshire Boulevard. This is a museum that's being created by George Lucas, and it's all about storytelling art. Here is his friend Steven Spielberg with one of the many pictures that George Lucas has collected over the years that talk about storytelling. This is a Norman Rockwell, where the storyteller is using his hands to tell the story. And Steven Spielberg is telling the same story in his, in his own way. Let's look at some of the work that he's chosen. These are, this is art that reflects the world around the artist, storytelling art. In this Greek amphora, you can see the two warriors and the sexy lady in the middle for whatever that story would be. And then Carrie Mae Weems, who we're gonna look at later in our third class this session, is showing us a woman who's grooming another woman at a part of her kitchen table series. It, they always have this, this light up above, giving it sort of the feeling of, of home, of an intimate feeling, and putting some light on the characters. Just like the Impressionists who showed this story over and over of one person grooming another. We see life as a black woman, black artist knows it in her lifetime. Here are two more pictures. Another black artist, J Jacob Lawrence, the Harlem street scene. We know him er from an earlier class for his migration series, incredible works that he did a whole series of them that uh, about the migration of the freed slaves from the South to the North. Here we're looking in the picture at the left, all the action of the street scenes in Harlem. On the right, in his elongated typical style, Thomas Hart Benton has a picture called Religion. He did picture after picture after picture mural after mural after mural, documenting 
the history of the United States. And here we're showing the witch trials. This is one story with three st storytellers. I'm pretty sure it's true that Washington did cross the Delaware. The picture in the upper right is the picture that has most often documented that passage. However, it's a, it's a little bit fantasized. I mean, icebergs on the Delaware, and if there were these icebergs in this rough passage, would, would Washington be standing up in that, that pose and, and the flag bearer? So it's a picture that has a little flaws in it. Down below it, you see a picture by Grant Wood called Daughters of the Revolution with three rather, rather smug ladies. I love the way she's holding that teacup. Patriotic ladies posing in front of what they think of as a patriotic picture, which has a, a, you know, a couple of fantasies in it. Well, for even better fantasy, we have Robert Colescott on the left, a picture that George Lucas acquired recently at auction. And he is here documenting all the fallacies, all the stereotypes of black culture. Aunt Jemima, the chef, the old fisherman, the banjo player. So we have three storytellers talking entirely different ways about something that's happened. Gordon Parks, another African-American who was a great photographer. These were done in the 50s. On the left, when I was talking about intellectual painting, lacking emotion, this is one that without words is telling a story that we may have some, some emotion and reaction to. It's a little girl coming in with her grandmother who's looking at the mannequins in a store window. And perhaps we think about her identification with them as being all white. The one on the right looks like a Norman Rockwell painting, but it is a very famous storefront also by Gordon Parks. Okay, new painter. This, this painter who lived both in the 18th and the 19th century had so many different styles, so many different ways of portraying life as he saw it, mostly in Spain. Let's look at a video about Francisco Goya. The life and works of Francisco de Goya. Francisco de Goya is one of Spain's most famous and cherished artists. Goya lived between 1746 and 1828 and created many works that varied in theme and style. Today, Goya's paintings and etchings can be seen in major museums around the world, including the Museo Nacional del Prado in Madrid, Spain. Born in Puente Toro, Spain, Goya was the son of a gilder. At a young age, his family moved to Saragossa, Spain, where Goya enjoyed painting as a child. Goya began studying art as an apprentice at the age of 14 in Spain, then later studied in Italy. After moving to Madrid, Goya began working in the workshop of two brothers, Francisco and Ramon Bayou. Goya soon fell in love with the brother's sister, Josefa. In 1773, Josefa and Goya married. In 1779, Goya was named a painter to the royal court of Spain. Goya would continue to work as a court painter over four monarchies. His skillful ability to paint detailed portraits garnered a following amongst the Spanish elite. One of Goya's most famous paintings of the royal court is King Charles IV of Spain and his family. The work was painted in 1800 and is now located in the Prado. There are several details that have made this painting a favorite amongst fans of Goya's work. One detail is the fact that Goya places himself with the royal family. He can be seen painting in the upper left corner. This could be a salute to Las Meninas by Diego Velazquez, another renowned Spanish artist. Throughout his life, Goya was never a stranger to controversy. 
Some art critics speculate that Goya's painting of the royal family is a critique on the Spanish aristocracy. Goya painted the family in an almost caricature-like manner and almost emphasizes some of the family members' unflattering traits. Although Goya spent his entire life painting commissioned works for the royal court and Spanish aristocracy, he was also a prolific artist outside of the court. Goya enjoyed painting scenes of everyday life around towns, at bullfights, and in poverty-stricken areas of Madrid. Goya also had a dark and fantastical side as a painter and etcher. Some art historians believe his darker paintings could have been caused by falling ill in 1792 and subsequently losing his hearing. Goya was almost entirely deaf for the rest of his life. The 3rd of May, 1808, is one of Goya's most well-known works outside of his court paintings. It was painted in 1814 and is currently exhibited at the Prado. The painting depicts Napoleon's army executing Spanish soldiers during the Peninsular War. The white-shirted soldier is haloed by light and in a Christ-like posture. Napoleon's faceless army resides in the dark, executing the defenseless Spanish. This symbolism makes Goya's alliance with the Spanish army clear. Toward the end of his life, Goya continued to create political paintings, especially after King Ferdinand VII came into power. Goya used his art to critique the Spanish government most powerfully in a series of works called Los Desperates. Toward the end of his life, Goya grew more and more dissatisfied with King Ferdinand. Eventually, Goya isolated himself from Madrid in a small country home. Between 1819 and 1823, Goya painted some of his darkest work directly on the walls of his home. The series of frescoes are now called the Black Paintings. One such work is Saturn devouring his son. Although Goya never intended for the works to be displayed publicly, they were removed from the walls of the home and transferred onto canvas in the late 1800s. The works can now be viewed at the Prado. As the political atmosphere of Spain became more turbulent, Goya exiled himself to France, where he died in 1828. Goya influenced many artists after his death, including Pablo Picasso. During his lifetime, Goya was recognized as one of the best portrait painters of Spain. In the 21st century, Goya is remembered as a painter whose style did not always fit in the Enlightenment period during which he lived. Many art historians consider Goya to be ahead of his time, creating modern art long before the modern era. Here are some fictional representations of Goya. I've seen Goya's Ghosts. I enjoyed it because I just like touching bases with his life and, and seeing his work whenever I can. And the other one, Goya in Bordeaux, I did not see. But in each case, they sort of make fun, sh show him wearing the hat with the candles that he used because he liked to paint in 10 hour series. And so he would wear these when it started getting dark. Usually I have at least one example of what we call ekphrastic poetry that I learned about through Rachel Weintraub, who's in this class. And here we have a painting, a, a poem by Billy Collins. I think a lot of people's favorite poet. I'm just gonna read the first two stanzas and the last one. And when you get the PowerPoint, you'll have a chance to read the whole thing. In most self-portraits is the face that dominates. Cezanne is a pair of eyes swimming in brush strokes. Van Gogh stares out of a halo of swirling darkness. Rembrandt looks relieved as if he were taking a breather from painting the, the blinding of Samson. But in this one, Goya stands well back from the mirror and is seen posed in the clutter of his studio addressing a canvas tilted back on a tall easel. He appears to be smiling out at us as if he knew we would be amused by the extraordinary hat on his head, which is fitted around the brim with candle holders, a device that allowed him to work into the night. And then the last stanza. 
imagine him flickering through the rooms of his house with all the shadows flying across the walls. Imagine a lost traveler knocking on his door one night in the hill country of Spain. Come in, he would say, I was just painting myself. As he stood in the doorway, holding up the wand of a brush illuminated in the blaze of his famous candle hat. Well, these were painted in the 18th century, some of his early work. They are paintings of the good life. They were done as paintings that were then made into tapestries. The colors lend themselves to that. Beautiful, beautiful jewel-like colors, a softness to them, to these paintings. And showing a romantic, a lyrical side of life, the swing, the parasol, even put parasol and even the crockery vendor has a romantic tinge to it. Look at those romantic skies. I put down at the bottom another parasol painting where the figure is romanticized and in my cruel way left out the name of the painter which will appear on your PowerPoint if you want to look at it. Giving you a second to remember that that is a painting by Monet Impressionist. But as it was said in the video, Goya had an edge. Even as a court painter, there's a lot of, of mockery really in a very subtle way that goes on in the family of Charles IV. I mean, those, those badges that the king is wearing, the, the bling could put your eye out. And then in the middle, we have that dowager who is peeking between the man in blue and the woman on the left. And what I read was, it's not a facial flaw, it's not a terrible disease, but, but that she thought it was still fashionable to wear a big beauty mark even though it got long got out of fashion, a little vanity. And on the right, painted after the, uh, about six years after the, um, somebody just put in the chat, the dowager has no teeth. Yes, it's not, it's not very flattering. Um, thanks for painting that out, pointing that out. He could have fixed her teeth with paint, but he didn't. And maybe it wasn't a bad look, to not have teeth, I don't know. But here we have another caricature of the same woman. And this is a painting, a single painting that's called The Time of the Old Women. Here we see her, the same earrings, the same facial features. And we see her perhaps made there holding up a mirror. On the mirror it says, que tal? Well, the maid looks a little bit skeletal, reminding us of Vanitas. And what is going to happen, Ketel, what's going to happen, what's going on, is that the angel of time has swept down and is going to be taking her away. And here's the 3rd of May close up. In it, we've said before about the drama, the chiaroscuro in it, the dark contrast between the the darkness of the French troops that are going to execute the, uh, friend, the Spanish nationalists. And above, I'm showing a close up showing the stigmata on the hands of the man who has his hands raised, which is another Jesus reference. On the right, we have Picasso, who is commenting on the Americans in Korea fighting a war in which many civilians were killed, showing the fusiliers, the uh, shooters on the right side and the population on the left. And of course, he also did Guernica, which is the same anti-subject, which we'll be looking at at another time. Here's a festival scene. Again, we have that lyricism, that romantic look in the foreground as the people are across the river from Madrid celebrating the festival of San Isidro.
And in contrast, we see in the black paintings that were, that were talked about in the video, other, another pilgrimage to San Ysidro. There's Madrid in the background, but these people look as if they're either in ecstasy or seizures or drunk or ju just singing. We can't overinterpret, but there's sort of a skeletal look also to the one that's at the top of that group, much darker than the earlier ones. Here's another festival, the burial of the sardine. It's a religious festival. At the end, they bury a sardine, and I don't know the significance of the sardine. That guy in the, in the banner is sort of the um, symbol for the festival. And I'm showing it because Goya saw a relationship between the madness of a festival. We might think about some rock concerts uh, mosh pits and that kind of thing. So you see the girl is raising her hands up there in front of the skeleton who is dancing behind her. To the right, Goya painted in insane asylums. And here you see that same raised hands back in that window. And you see the interaction of some of the people who are in the insane asylum that he equated with the same mad frenzy. And then the black paintings were talked about. They were transferred from the house onto canvas and are in the Prado. He was in a house that was already named the Quinta del Sordo, which is the villa of the deaf man. And he by this time was totally deaf. Look at the fusilier down below doing the same thing as in the 3rd of May. And the people that are rising up from, from the everyday life to some sort of a, a vision beyond. So I'm contrasting the picture below, the witch's Sabbath, which has is a phantasmagoria of, of, of grotesqueries. That, that's a, I should get uh, extra points for that vocabulary. But they are all sort of distorted, distorted people in very dark colors. Contrast it to the pictures up at the right, which are those ones that I said were done for tapestries early in his career. The one on the right is also a witch's Sabbath, done in those bright colors. Look at that wonderful sky beyond. At night, the sky is again dramatic, but that sort of moiré effect with the moon, I think is fabulous as a contrast with the, the subject matter in the foreground. And I'm going to be pointing that out in another painting, that same kind of the sky in our class next week. So on the left, we have two gorgeous women that are in the tradition of Tisha and Giorgione, of Venus, of Manet's Olympia. Go, go, get, go get. Goya is doing the dressed Maya and the nude Baya that are in the Prado. Contrast in these to the to the way that he is showing humanity in the black paintings. On the left, the sweet picture of the child playing with the bird that's out of its cage, a member of the court. These are his court paintings. And on the right, the one that we showed in the video, the hideous Saturn devouring one of his sons. Saturn was told that they would take over as a god, and so he's devouring one of his sons. So what's the story? This is a black painting of the single dog down below. I think it's exquisite. It was the one that the last time I was in the Prado, it, it did capture my imagination um, more than, than some of the other paintings that I was looking at. The dog, is it being sucked into some kind of a quicksand or into, hall, into a type of hell? Or is it ascending from a difficult life and ascending up to the heaven? You can read about the praise for this very simple picture about how Goya was painting life when you look at the PowerPoint. 
And here it is with Pierre Bonal, much happier. Pierre Bonal giving a little homage to the dog painting in this genre scene of a, a woman at the checkered tablecloth. New painter. That painter self-portrait is hidden in this big picture called A Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda Park. I want you to see if you can spot the artist. There's actually two artists in the painting. Then I show the artist in the detail. To the left of the Katarina, which is the beautiful skeleton who's always gorgeously dressed for the Day of the Dead, we see a portrait of the painter's wife, Frida Kahlo. We'll be looking at her work. She's holding kind of like a yin and yang thing. Maureen, I see that you've got Frida Kahlo on the chat. That's cool. So yes, we're gonna be looking at her in depth in our third session. But look at the little boy to the left of Frida Kahlo. That's the self-portrait of the next artist. It's Frida Kahlo's husband, Diego Rivera. Photograph and three self-portraits. In the final one, which is not as flattering as most of his self-portraits are, um, you see the, the woman working with the flowers in the background. That is a common subject that Diego Rivera painted. He painted homage to Mexico in many ways. The two at the top, the flower vendors are, I think, quintessential Diego Rivera. They are monumentalizing, like Greek sculptures, the workers in Spain, the flower vendors. Uh, Diego Rivera was a communist, often talks about workers in labor. But these are such beautiful lyrical paintings even though they're done in this very stylized, monumental way. Down below, I show that picture on the wall of SF MoMA to remind us that oh, there is Diego Rivera there right now that I'm gonna talk about in a couple of minutes. But in July, they're gonna have a Diego Rivera show. So you see the flower vendor and to the left, you see a self-portrait that Frida Kahlo did of the couple. We know him also for his huge and story, filled with story murals. What we have here is the whole history of Mexico from primordial times through the Aztecs, through the conquistadores, through Montezuma, Cortez, and revolution all the way through the history of Mexico. As I said, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo were communists and were quite active with their feelings about the communist ideology. And doing in, sh in showing that, he did this painting called Frozen Assets. And he is showing New York, New York, the sky, the high rises that some people say because New York is a financial center of the world is one of the reasons that other countries and ideologies don't like us. But this is the New York of the depression. Underneath that, we see a homeless shelter during the depression where people are stacked like sardines on cots. Then, in the very bottom, underground, we see a vault. And that is the vault where the rich people during the depression, according to Diego Rivera, are hiding their, um, their frozen assets. Well, I learned about this painting in the novel that you see to the left that we have been studying in Renee Curry's class called The Barbarian Nurseries. And it's about a Mexican, uh, undocumented ex Mexican housekeeper, who at one point in the story is put in jail. 
And she talks about what the cells were like with the beds for the jail keepers. And she says, they were all in a kind of frozen storage, these women in their blue jumpsuits sitting on their beds, some with charcoal blankets thrown over them, a hundred, <laughs> hundred grungy little dolls in their cells stacked up like toy blocks, reminding her of a Diego Rivera piece from the Red Star Marxist didactic days, a painting depicting bodies filling a bank vault, frozen assets. So the writer, Hector Tobar, saw the relationship between the, the bodies that are lined up and the frozen assets that are being put in the vault. Here's a painting, a mural that, oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna be showing now more about his mural that he did in New York. So we'll do that and then we'll come back to this one. The 1930s were a time of political turmoil. The stock market crash of 1929 led to the Great Depression. In 1933, the unemployment rate in the United States was 25%, leaving many people starving in the streets. During those desperate times, people turned to more radical political views. Italy, Portugal, Germany, and Spain turned to authoritarian right-wing regimes. Seeing wealth inequality as an important cause of the misery of the working class, communism also gained popularity. Man was truly at a crossroads. That will be the theme that Diego Rivera was asked by John D. Rockefeller Jr. to be painted on the walls of the Rockefeller Center's lobby. Rivera was a Mexican muralist, along with Jose Clemente Orozco and David Alfaro Siqueiros. These artists painted walls because it was the best way to democratize art. They made art that was accessible to everyone, and that art was often social and political. Rivera was a communist, and he'd even go as far as living in 1937 with Leon Trotsky, a famous anti-Stalinist communist. In 1922, he joins and gets highly implicated in the Mexican Communist Party. In 1929, he will marry another notable Mexican communist artist, Frida Kahlo. In 1931, Rivera has an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Arts in New York City, which he will attend with Kahlo. The next year, he paints the Detroit Industry Murals at the Detroit Institute of Arts, where he gives homage to Detroit workers, which he will portray having different skin colors. He puts in a bit of communist imagery and paints the bourgeoisie as observers of the working class. Fascinated by the industrial machines, he makes them a centerpiece of the painting, but doesn't forget to also paint the downside of machinery, which is the growing war industry. In 1933, a lot of those themes come back in the lobby of the Rockefeller Center with, of course, machinery separating the painting in two. On the left side of the man at the crossroads, Rivera pictures the bourgeoisie, partying while, next to it, the working class is starving. He paints warplanes and armies. On the right side, you see a group of workers of different ethnicities. At the center of these particular workers, the portrait of a man will cause tremendous controversy. Rivera decides to paint Vladimir Lenin, the Russian communist revolutionary. Of course, the Rockefellers, the richest family in the United States, were at the extreme opposite of communist ideas. They were capitalists, and they didn't like the fact that a portrait of Lenin was on their wall. They asked Rivera to remove Lenin from the painting, which he refused. In 1934, the Rockefellers destroyed the mural. Rivera was furious. He decided to go back to Mexico and recreate the same mural. He renames the mural to Man Controller of the Universe and adds a portrait of Trotsky. He also paints Marx and Engels, the authors of the Communist Manifesto. On the opposite side of Lenin, he also paints Lenin's political opposite, John D. Rockefeller Jr. himself. In this mural, Rivera opposes capitalism and communism. On the capitalist side, there is war, wealth inequality, police repression, while on the communist side, there is solidarity and unity. 
Aside from political images, there's also science and technology, starting with a portrait of Charles Darwin surrounded by different animals. There are also lenses which allow to see with microscopes the infinitely small, but also with telescopes the infinitely big. Rivera made a great display of artistic integrity. He painted what he wanted, without submitting himself to the political apprehensions of his patrons. He painted an amazing portrait of the Great Depression, representing its technological advancements and its political struggles. This is one of his murals that he did in San Francisco, and it is at the was at the City College of San Francisco. It is called The Marriage of the Artistic Expression of the North and the South on this continent, North America, commonly known as Pan-American Unity. You can see that it's all done in little square, in little big square pieces. These are big square pieces of plaster. And now we can show the next slide. Recently, the whole mural was transported to the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. You can see them working here on it. Down in the lower left-hand corner, I show the atrium in San Francisco at the museum where you can enter free without entering uh, the rest of the museum. It used to, when the museum was first renovated, they showed a big sculpture by Richard Serra. Now it's filled with this mural. And here it is. It is magnificent. It was created in 1940 for the Golden Gate International Exposition on Treasure Island. In the middle panels, up at the top, you see a vision of San Francisco Bay. On it, on the right, under the diver, you see Treasure Island, where the exposition was held. In the middle, you see the big piece that on one side, the left side, has the dark arm and shows the history of Mexico. And on the right, you see the gears that show America and the industrialization and war. So uh, it, the experience, uh, we saw it right after it came. The conservators were, were still working on it. You see her up close working on this piece. You can see the lines that show the individual panels that had to be transported. I like the one on the right because it is a conservator, a painter, who's working on a painting within a painting. I really recommend this. The comments on war, once again, we think back to the 3rd of May and Picasso on Korea. These comments on the impending war, well, the, the war that is raging in Europe that will join the following year are interesting. It shows Charlie Chaplin in the role of Hitler in The Great Dictator, an anti-war film. It shows Mussolini. On the right, we see a self-portrait of a um, of Diego Rivera. It looks a little bit like Edward G. Robinson, if you remember him. Down on the right of that panel, you see a woman mourning the death of her child, which I also think of is in Picasso's Guernica, Charlie Chaplin up above. Look at the image that he's done, a surrealistic image of the gas mask that were shown in the uh, Rockefeller piece. Down below, I showed you the connection that I had with this when I saw the Russian artist at the Venice Biennale. Phil, in the Biennale, they have permanent buildings in uh, parks for all the, the nations of the world that want to, and they've been there for years. In the Russian pavilion, they had a room that had this giant gas mask and inside a living head. Then we went, I'm gonna go fast now because I wanted to have save time for you to have a discussion. And I see there's a lot on the chat. But if you haven't been to Coit Tower to see the murals there, they were done during the depression in the WPA in the 
free lobby of the Coit Tower. Here is one that shows the teacher of many of these artists, Diego Rivera at the top there in this mural that is done of the newspaper office. Now I'm gonna go fast through Turner, showing his work also that was shown in movies. Let's show the next one. There's the movie, Mr. Turner, and it shows him as it did in that character above in, in the last slide where he was fixing a painting after it was unveiled at a gallery. And then down the lower right, him with a fantastic sky. This slave ship painting is one of his most famous. What it shows is all of the slaves that were being tossed over the slave ship because a typhoon is coming and the captain wants to lighten his load. Of course, what dominates the painting is that incredible sunset. So you can see a little bit more detail here of the, pe the people that are into that broiling sea. And then I showed you close up the leg that is sticking out that still has the manacle on it of the slave. And comparing that to the fall of Icarus, where in this dramatic fall from the sky, all you see is the feet, legs splashing in front of the boat people not ignoring major catastrophes, or people not paying attention to major catastrophes. And Turner gets more and more abstract. And so I'm showing this cartoon that says that it's supposed to be a dispute between Minerva and Neptune over the naming of the city of Athens, but I'm not seeing it. So what we have here is a painter that is going more and more abstract. Some women would say that he's improving. I don't see it that way. I don't see that getting uh, more abstract is improving, but you'll see that in his work. So here's his approach to Venice, where you can barely see Venice, contrasted with Canaletto, who was sort of the master of showing the city of Venice. And here we have Norm Sunrise Castle, barely see the castle. But here's another sunrise painting, a very famous one. And it is the Impression Sunrise that gave the name to Impressionism because it's just hinting at Impressionism. And what we have here is a Monet. So I had to toss in a little impressionist humor. What if we had unimpressionist? A perfectly banal work, mon ami. Merci, but it's not nearly as dull as yours. So here's a Turner view of Margate, which is the seaside town that you see in the movie, where you really can't see the town, but you see an impression of the scene in deep fog. To the right, there's a photograph, and it was taken from Bolinas, California. And it's showing the sea in the same way that Turner is showing it. But he is, that Tim Burns is paying homage to Rothko that we'll see in the next slide. So on the left, you see sun setting over a lake by Turner, his impression of it. You can barely see the reflections there. And to the right, one of our most famous abstract artists, not abstract expressionist, but pure abstract in what he calls a color field work is a Rothko, showing the same type of an approach to showing the images of color as he sees it. 